So if I could invite the five panellists just to introduce themselves and, and give a, back, a bit of a background to their experience. Howard Johns, um, MD of Encom uh, Energy Performance. So uh, a pan-European O&M business um, in the UK. We've got, in the last year and a half, we've gone from next to nothing to about 360 megs of uh, assets under management. My background is I've been in solar since 1999. Um, and uh, have far too many stories to tell, which I won't indulge you with this afternoon. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, um, Jordi from Glenmont Partners, uh, Head of Asset Management. We're managing 850 megawatts across Europe, of which uh, 220 are solar assets. The rest are wind, uh, mainly in Italy, and biomass assets in the UK. Oh, me. Hi. Uh, Right, Abit Kazim, Next Energy Capital, uh, listed in 2014, uh, currently the largest of the listed uh, solar holders in the UK, with about 460 megawatts, so not that big, but uh, still growing. We'll see. Hi, everyone, Francesco Girardi from Bluefield. I don't want to fight against you, but I can tell you that our figure has larger than yours. Being, we are now <laughs> being, being overweight and a bit tubby does not qualify for grandeur, okay? We are, now, we are now maybe the first, no, no, maybe the second, but at least we are within um, the second largest after light source uh, uh, investors in the UK. And um, we are on um, about 480 megawatt of projects. I joined uh, so Bluefield, got foresight. I jo joined Bluefield in uh, 2013 and I'm a CEO of Bluefield Services as well, which is the asset management company of Bluefield. Good evening. It's, my name is uh, Arturo Grauso. I'm uh, head of commercial in the asset management department in uh, Sonedix. Sonedix, I don't know is uh, an IPP, independent power producer, with uh, roughly 300 megawatt in Europe, mainly distributed in uh, Italy, France, and Spain. We are, I think, one of the smallest investors in the UK with just one plant of four megawatt. <laughs> <laughs> Plenty to get through for, for this topic um, to, and also to uh, provide a couple of minutes at the end for some questions. So we'll get cracking on. Um, just from my list of topics, uh, something to uh, build on from some of what we heard this morning. Um, as the UK waits for subsidy-free solar to become uh, available or, or economical, um, what opportunities can existing assets offer, uh, particularly in terms of, of grid management opportunities? Uh, we don't have assets in the UK, so I think it would be <laughs> <laughs> This is the comedy part. Yeah. The end of what was the Anyone? question again? <laughs> <laughs> uh, question again, uh, what opportunities uh, can existing assets offer, uh, particularly in the fields of grid management? Okay, well, I was already getting, I hadn't fallen asleep, I was just thinking about him. Um, we actually worked this routine so, out beforehand to keep you all awake, you realise that? I was so excited by his girth. Um, we got, uh, okay, so let, let's be clear. Um, some of the funds have come out recently and said that they're going to start to optimise their existing assets more as part of their investment programme over the next couple of years. And there's a very valid reason for doing that. So the, what is the most valuable thing that you own in a solar part, right? I mean... An accountant would say cash, which is a massive cash generator. A technologist would say panels and inverters and strings and cables. A lawyer would say title. Uh, actually, the grid connection is extraordinarily valuable. We talked about data earlier on. But the grid connection is probably the one thing, if you can get it right, <coughs> creates value beyond the 20, 25 years of the plant ownership. So what do you do with the grid connection today? You would just seek to optimize its life. You might want to extend your planning permissions and extend lease terms. Tomorrow you might want to be able to exercise more value through your grid connection. If you've got import capacity, you might want to put, you might want to go for EFR, might want to go for HFR, might want to put, see if you can put batteries on the site, put, put gas turbines on the site, do something exciting with the site. That's the grid connection. And then the other end of the scale is what you'd want to do with the plant itself and maximize its value in terms of its generation capacity. And interestingly, the one thing that constrains you the most is your grid connection. Because the sun shines in June, it doesn't shine in December, and you know, you're, you're constrained in June. 
So maximizing or increasing production in certain months of the year doesn't add any value, it hits your ceiling too soon. But you could, you could look at coatings, you could look at power optimizers, you could look at interesting things to increase the per hour yield. And well, earlier on today we talked about data. Fundamentally, in the, the, the traditional use of a plant, the per hour yield is the one thing you have to maximize. Everything else is metrics, leading or, or, or lagging the metrics, PR, availability, what have you. But per hour yield is the most important thing. So if you're sitting on a thousand hours KWA, KWH, KWB, you want to be able to get that to 1,100 hours. Why? Because that 100 hours is cream. It's just cream. You've already paid for everything else. So, you know, you've got grid opportunities, extremely valuable over time. You've got the plant itself, maximizes cash yield. And then fundamentally, the data that's produced from these things allows you to think, look at things like debtor days, creditor days, looks at your banking facilities, interesting financing options, which aren't available right now for grid enhancements. Right? You're not going to get a banking deal for a battery today. Somebody was talking to me about the woohoo, huge size of battery market at three gigawatts. Frankly, I've seen toilet paper bigger than that. You know, it, it's a small market today. And so you know, we have an opportunity to maximize these values across the spectrum. Whatever you do, as long as you own those plants, you're going to have value maximization or value incre increment uh, opportunities over life. Top that, baby. Yeah, I, I agree with your last statement, so it's a good point. Um, because um, definitely grid uh, uh, optimization and management of the grid in the, in the best way. Of course, uh, as operator, because what does it mean grid management, first of all? We are just uh, asset owners. We are not uh, uh, network operators. So we can, what we can do is to ensure that the generation, uh, the electricity generated by our solar farms or whatever distributed generation systems are, do they comply? Of course, they have to comply by default with the regulation, but uh, also, that we have to make sure that uh, any issues or disturbances on the grid network, uh, they, which might affect our ability to export and generate and feed kilowatt hours into the grid, are limited. How we can do that? We can do that maybe in different ways. First, first of all, uh, for less technical but more relationship-based, is uh, to create a good uh, network relationship with the, the DNOs. And this is started being doing here in the UK. I can tell you that based on my personal experience, the first time I've seen uh, the grid having a so, a so huge importance, as uh, Abid said in the, in the distributed generation is uh, here in the UK, because the grid network is quite weak, let me say. In Italy, uh, for example, maybe people who have solar farm or distributed generation system in Italy, they can comment, or in Germany, they suffer uh, less uh, constraint or outages on the grid rather than the UK. So uh, having said that, so uh, we started with them in the industry by establishing good uh, can say, communication channel between uh, the distributor generation owners and uh, the DNOs to help them understand what our needs are and do work together with them in order to make sure that any, ever, sorry, ever um, um, prolong the maintenance plan or outages will be affected is managing, kissing, try to achieve the best common interest between the parties. On top of that, I think that another way is uh, to, uh, and uh, again, uh, Germany is a bit ahead of the UK in this sense, uh, Italy is coming, is following, and I think that uh, depends on the penetration of uh, distributed generation system into the grid, this will become more and more a requirement from the DNO, the DSO, and the TS, um, national grid to ensure that um, the grid is kept, kept stable. How do this can work uh, with our support? How we can work together with that? I guess that um, what we've seen, and will be very soon <coughs> replicated in the UK, will be working with the forecasting mechanisms, which will allow the and the operators of the grid to understand what they would expect to receive in a particular day from the various uh, uh, generations spread around the country. And uh, put more intelligence into our system to make sure that uh, both the, oh, we are not, again, we're not going to manage the demand side, but we, we can control the generation side. 
I guess that put, putting more intelligence, and maybe with the support of an uh, energy source system, might, in principle, on, from a technical perspective, then we have to look at the feasibility from a financial point, point of view, might help in uh, making sure that uh, situations like this uh, can be improved and then optimize you know, the, our ability to feed in more kilowatt hours into the grid. Okay. Well, from Sonic's perspective, uh, uh, I guess that everybody, everything has been already said. Uh, what can I add uh, to the discussion is that uh, it really depends on the grid requirements. So as Francesco said, we have to comply with the re grid requirements. But imagine uh, having very strict grid requir requirements in islands like Puerto Rico and Hawaii. <laughs> Here is much more difficult to comply. And uh, what we have done, and the technology that have, we have put in place in Puerto Rico, it's quite good. So we install batteries to comply with the grid requirements. And basically, these batteries were helping us to uh, have frequency response, ramp up, ramp down, so try to stabilize the production of the solar park, and also curtailment control. Just briefly. Just to touch on, on, that, sto on that storage point then um, for a minute or two, um, I know at our um, finance event in January, we, we had the likes of Next Energy, uh, Bluefield, Foresight, were <coughs> slightly pessimistic about the, the current opportunity. So, yeah, The reason being is that the storage for the past couple of years has been a great answer waiting for a question. So we have things like EFR, which requires immediate response under nine seconds. Batteries make sense, but so, so do inverter, inverters with capacitors. You know? They only run for 30 seconds, so what do you need? I mean, that's a battery solution in its own making. The reality is that you've got lots of things you can do with batteries, and people have gone for capacity mechanisms using gas plus you know, whatever, whatever, whatever. And the reality is that batteries haven't quite broken through yet. The cost is too high. You know, even if you were to somehow mix solar with battery and get a capacity auction value at 2022, which is what you're going to go for now, you're going to get £19 real. So £22, £23 by the time you get there. On a 15-year contract on an asset, on a, on a battery that has a seven-year life and needs to be refreshed at least once, the numbers don't stack up. So that, you know, I get hit by hundreds of EPCs, and I mean hundreds, of EPCs that talk about how they're going to sell me this fantastic battery solution and I as an infrastructure fund at a ridiculously low hurdle rate is going to somehow snap that up at a premium price. I mean, that's a level of Kool-Aid drinking that I've never seen before. Uh, and, and the reality is that there are private equity funds that, that will get involved in batteries today. And they'll get involved and they'll say three gigawatts is a huge market. But if somebody like us mm. want to get involved as infrastructure funds, We'd want to get involved with three gigawatts was a transaction, okay, or a part of a transaction, because you, you, the returns aren't sufficient to justify the risk. You know, a, a battery installation today needs to make 13% returns. Why? Because I don't know what the revenue stream next year is. We don't have a clue. You might get this year's capacity at nine, six pounds at 70, on a hope that you're going to get 2022. And then you come 2022, you're thinking, oh, I'm going to get triads. The number of people who tried to sell us triads two months ago, seriously, they're not very noisy anymore. They were pretty vocal about my retarded ability to not look at the marketplace. Um, so the reality is that batteries aren't here yet. They're too expensive by a factor of three, and the revenue streams are not clear yet to justify a, a cost that currently exists. I don't want to... Uh create a precedent, but I agree with a bit. Uh, <laughs> uh, I fully agree with him. It means uh, an investor like us, for example, no? uh, and I think there is a transition, no? and it's something that we discussed yesterday in the panel in terms of, you know, clearly we're moving into a market in which you will have grid parity, you move into CFDs, there are tenders everywhere in Europe now, uh, the tender in Spain, uh, they not even separate by technology, which means for solar, you know, it's going to be tough. Um, so if you look into it, really, uh, a player like Lemon, for example, no? we started with filling tariffs in Portugal uh, and France. Then you move to uh, Aro in the UK, you know, taking more exposure to the brown power. Then we are looking now potentially into grid parity projects. 
so, so you're transitioning, but, but, but at the end of the day, you're talking about managing a power plant that is generating electricity that you're selling to the grid. Uh, and clearly, you know, you, you can make it bankable. To make bankable uh, energy storage, to be honest with you, um, I don't know how you can do it. Uh, capacity market in the UK, uh, pricing, some of them were super competitive. Uh, and actually, you know, the, 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 the tenor of that capacity market is very limited for the investment that you are doing. Uh, and I think the other point which is critical is that, the, as Abit said, you know, the technology breakthrough on, on uh, uh, batteries is not there. You know, we're talking about very old traditional batteries that the only thing they have done is, you know, economies of scale in terms of reduction of cost and scale up, really. But it's the same technology. No one has really developed something in a large scale, which is actually a game changer, which means you're going to invest in something that in a year time is going to cost you half if you buy it again, which means you know, if there's no barriers to entry in the, into the market, it's just retarded to invest into battery storage. But, but it will happen. I mean, yeah, right. It will happen, yeah. yeah. It could be a great opportunity over the next three, four, five years. It's just not today. Okay. Anyway, just to clarify, the battery that we install in Puerto Rico are to satisfy the minimal technical requirement from the grid. It's not to shift the production. Or whatever. No, no, no. But <laughs> I think that um, one of the reasons why also battery storage is still uh, not financially viable is uh, because, uh, again, the technology has not uh, grown up in scale as uh, solar is currently. So I think that, um, I mean, um, Howard mentioned that they work in solar since 1999. I think that nobody that time, but also later, maybe until uh, 2008, 2008 or maybe 2009, nobody thought to never try to build up a solar farm in the UK or even in Scotland. This was now possible because of the drop into the installation cost. And um, nowadays, uh, battery storage is still not yet there, also because there are no incentives also worldwide to to say foster the growth of the batteries of battery storage, so I guess that uh, unfortunately I will not expect anything uh, coming out from Europe. Maybe uh, different, difficult to be come from to come out from other countries. I guess this would be just uh, based on the market, you know, real capacity to drop down the price and to make them compatible with the current level of revenue streams. Just going back to the point about Puerto Rico, so I know that this is the example, so, you know, when it can work, uh, there are specific examples, as, you know, islands, for example. So the, the French Guiana, you know, in terms of interconnection with neighbor countries, it, it's non-existent. So EDF built a, a solar plant with battery storage, but they, be, they made it based on a tender in which there was a specific tariff, which included the energy produ produced by the solar plant, including the investment with a battery system for 15 years. So in that case, it makes plenty of sense. Uh, tenders in capacity market in the UK with you know, the pricing that we are talking about and the tenor of these uh, tenders, it doesn't make any sense. In addition, there is not uh, a regulatory framework that is still supporting the yeah. 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 Exactly. Um, how will I know um, this, this is something that you, that you can actually contribute to? Um, standardization um, is, a, is a, a significant buzzword, seems to be um, around a, a kind of every kind of asset management conference uh, that you'll go to. Um, how, if you could just perhaps give us an introduction what, it, what that kind of actually means and, and how it can be of benefit to asset owners. Yeah, well, I mean, so for instance, we have a number of frameworks with some of the asset owners well, we'll standardise O and M contracts, for example, across their whole portfolio. So the legal costs of implementing O and M contracts are reduced. Standardised schedules of services, um, that sort of stuff. But then also standardise our response, so the technology we use to to actually deliver that. Um, I think it's absolutely fundamental delivering O and M now to do that. I mean, we all all the players in the room know that the you know, pricing is not exactly generous. You know, people want a lot of service for not much money. Um, you know, so for us to be able to deliver that, we actually really need to be very organised and therefore standardisation really comes in. So you know, certainly what we've been doing as a company is rolling out technology which enables us to, to standardise our offering and make it much more efficient. Um, so I think it's, it's a key part to O&M moving forwards and it's a key part to making these guys' assets work properly. Um, you know, that <coughs> being, able to, being able to offer that, that, that sort of economies of scale for them basically. 
Abbott I saw some raised eyebrows there. Uh, you're saying he, you know, the standardisation is a key part to making our assets work properly. I think the reality is as, as elements of any industry commoditize. And as they commoditize, you can standardise. So O&M is commoditizing. However, it's not really even started the journey yet. So aspects of standardization like monitoring systems sometimes or contracts, you, 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 one can gain benefit from those. But realistically, anything that, that matures commoditizes. Um, we are seeing O&M as a good example is going to change over the next five years. I've been saying this for how many years now? But Look. I was about four years old when yeah. I started. I remember it was a long time ago, halfway through my first year at Hogwarts. And the, 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 the reality is that the mobile telephony industry and the IT industry are the benchmarks that we're going to achieve. Right? Um, full stop. Mobile telephony is 99.9% of .9 availability and their uptime performance is off, off the scale when you compare it to cell. And, and we're not there yet. So actually, O&M isn't a commodity yet. It had a, a sense of commoditization because of lots and lots of competition as small players with weak balance sheets try to find ways to compete. And actually, I'm really quite happy that actually some of these players are now looking at uh, non-commodity services to as a means of having more fun in their day job, but also making more money. So the market is changing. It's not commoditizing yet. Standardization for solar is... Is, is, is actually, well, frankly, it's too early. Um, we, we don't have a standard solution that makes sense anywhere in the world. So I've been talking about, and we've all been talking about cookie cutters for years. But what is a cookie cutter? A cookie cutter says, I've got an EPC. I'm pointing to one right now. I've got an EPC. He's lost his hair. He was, he was a hippie three years ago. Um, we, you know, and, and we will do one deal, and then the next five deals will be the same. Have any of our deals been the same? The truth? <laughs> Let's look at another EPC I bought stuff from who's got the courage to stand up and talk. Nobody, they've all committed suicide. Fine. <laughs> the reality is that it's never standardized because the market's too early. And we want to standardize. It is working that way. We're on a journey. We're on a journey. Yeah, it's a learning curve. But what we can do is we can pick up little bits of the sector and say, we will commoditize this. There's a young man over there who I've spoken to twice now. I haven't ignored you. I don't remember your name because I'm 400 years old. It's nothing to do with you. And the reality is that he can offer me standardized cleaning services across the country. Woohoo! Can't use you right now because I've got hundreds of EPC contracts that aren't expired yet. So yes, we're heading towards it. We have nice ideas about what we could standardize. We could disaggregate O&M. We could talk about a standard design solution. Right, where the topography is always the same. We don't have a desert in this country. Right? And it's not there yet. So that's why I say humbug to standardization. Well, I mean, I sort of agree, I agree on one level in that you know, we take, we've taken on a lot of plants in the last year and the quality has varied massively. You know, so to, to think that the plants themselves are standardized, they're certainly not. Yeah. There are aspects of our offering that we can standardize to reduce the costs and that sort of stuff. But in reality, the plants themselves need very focused attention, a lot of them to get them to a standard where they're going to perform to the sort of levels you need them to perform. And, and market competition means that each one of us wants to be better than the next guy. We have to be. I have to be better than him because um, we're raising money in the market. He has to be better than me for exactly the same reason. So therefore, what do we do? We hire the number one talented person that we can buy. Why the most talented person? Because the systems aren't standardized. The designs aren't standardized. Our investors aren't standardized. The, the o and is not standardised, the monitoring solution is not standardised, the data that we use, and there's all the same data, by the way, that's the only thing that is standardised, it's all the same data, we don't use in a standard fashion. So what do we do? We get the most competent person we can with the best talent, and we, we give them the ability to do their job magnificently. We all do the same thing. And actually, sometimes we win and sometimes we lose, but generally that's all we can do. And so if you're in a market which is about having the best talent doing the best that they can do, that's not a standardized market. So what can the solar market, the European solar market do to progress towards a more standardized market? I should say some, some of the asset owners that we're working with are moving, you know, they have moved to that standardized yeah. you know, so approach where they have got the same contracts across their portfolio and they have got you know, one cleaning contract and you know, they have backed out of the O&M contracts that they're in. So I think you're just in a different position, I mean, in that you've 
grown very rapidly in the last year and a half. People who've had assets for two or three years, they're already in that place, basically. And if so, you um, think about the cost of complexity, <coughs> that you actually cannot see, you cannot easily measure it, but it's there. The cost of complexity of having uh, plants built by different EPC, different o and in place, different equipment, and actually assets portals, coming. All that yeah. sort of stuff. Uh, you buy assets in the secondary market, they all comes with different monitoring systems, it's, it's, it's a mess. So at a certain point, maybe you cannot standardize, but you can try to standardize. That's what we will do. But you can't standardize the product until the product is standardized. So not all solar plants are created equal. You want service level agreements in akin to the IT industry, but if we're going to build an IT server farm, we're going to go to a premier brand of computers. They've been making the same computers. They're going to have the, fan, the very best fans in the world. For every computer you require 100% uptime for, we're going to have two computers available. And we're nowhere near that in the solar industry. We've got all sorts of tat out there mixed in with some good stuff. And then we're just hoping that we can hit 99% availability on it. And that's just not practical. Not yet. I wish there were more EPCs here, otherwise I'm just going to have a go at one person. So, and it's not fair because... It's, it's the last know, it's, man standing. Well, it's BSR for God's sake. But Mark and I have talked about the last three years about service levels the way you've been describing it and nobody's booked towards it, including him. Right? It's not easy because of the thing you just said. Right? And, 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 and yeah, we're standardised. Every plant we buy, and here's a plug for my friend Humberto, every plant we buy, we put... GPM on the plant. However, we also have built our own, not built our own, but worked in a very close partnership with Synaptique to build a, a management tool that allows us to integrate multiple plants with multiple technologies across multiple investor clients. Why? Because of what you've just described. That, that fragmentation of the market, particularly not just in the UK, but across Europe, how much of, a, of an issue is it for asset owners when it comes to standardising O&M contracts or, or optimising assets? Encom's got 900 megawatts across Europe, and you know they're, they're huge issues across the whole portfolio. You know, in, in different different in different countries, depending on the regulatory setup and, and, and uh, the type of asset owner. You know, because they're, they're distinctly different <coughs> markets. You know, Germany versus UK is very very different market, very very different pressures. You know, you've got a very, um, shall I say, a sophisticated bunch of investors sat here. Look at them, all they marvelous. Um, <laughs> Italian suits and the works, uh, you know, whereas in Germany the, the contracts are 25 years long and people don't change. In, in the UK, people are looking actively, they want to move on in two years' time, they want to maximise their value. So it is very different across, across yeah. Europe. No, I, I agree. It means for us, for example, our assets are around, uh, for solar, I mean, uh, four to five year old. So, you know, I think it's different phase on, on the project life. Uh, in terms of, you know, we have th gone through all the EPC claims and warranties uh, and all these yeah. punch list painful process. <laughs> so now, after that, you know, uh, we, we started the standardization after that. Before that, you know, you're a bit ring fans in terms of the warranties, but now we have been able uh, to run a few tenders to change your names, uh, clean up the assets, I would say, changing all the service providers, uh, all the EPCs have been removed. So, for example, last year we ran a tender of 48 megawatts of solar in, in Italy. So that, you know, with a new ki kind of nameplate contract with, you know, preventive, corrective maintenance, clear SLA service times, uh, replacing SCADA systems in the plants. Uh, this year we're running a tender of 55 megawatts of solar in France. So, again, you know, changing contracts uh, and standardizing the, the way you operate and the way you incentivize the o and as well, uh, which I think with that you can do a lot, you know. Uh, for example, an area for standardization is that how you create a partnership with the ONM rather than moving from discussing on availabilities, and which are very easy to achieve, or PR targets, looking to, for example, uh, energy-based target in which, you know, when you reach a specific P50, you have a bonus mechanism to the ONM. So everyone, you know, you know, when you reach a threshold and, you know, at a certain point, actually, they can make the upside that the project can make. So th th there's a lot of things that you can do, really, but I think in the UK, as a lot of projects are still in warranty and you are discussing with the EPC, you're really restricted on what you can do. So, It's quite clear that um, each of us in the individual company have tried to implement a standard, sort of standardization processes. I guess that this means that standardization is definitely good to have and it would be good also if uh, within the industry we can work together with uh, 
the same in the same industry in the same sector maybe maybe also in the larger renewable energy sector to make sure that there are some common languages at least to speak because most of the time when you talk about availability when you talk maybe about PR in some instances maybe it's not now the case but it was maybe six or seven years ago there are different formulas there are different concepts there are different criteria commissioning of a solar farm Apart from what is a local requirement, there is not a full, I can say, a common standard for a proper commissioning of the solar farm. Otherwise, we would not have spent so much time, maybe, in discussing. I'm pretty sure that he was very good in the arguing with the BSR about how bad was the, the, the plant they built or what, how good it was, and try to come out with a proper solution in the end to fix all the punch list items, etc. So if we had the proper commissioning process at, in time, the contractor mm -hmm. and the agreed the standard process, maybe the contractor would have been able to spot those defects or issues or potential installation problems at a very early stage and then improve the commissioning process, make it more quicker, more stable, more efficient. Um, there are different examples. The fact that I agree, don't remember your name, sorry, but I agree with your statement that uh, it, the complexity of uh, the various components, equipment, technology, contract, procedure, does make uh, this uh, uh, task uh, easy. It's very difficult, but it does, the difficulty will not prevent us to start doing that. Indeed, um, Solar Power Europe, STA are already working together differently on the uh, them standards, and uh, the, I guess this is a quite a good example of uh, you see how keen the players are. And if I can add something, imagine trying to standardize when you operate, not only in Europe, but in Latin America, in Japan, in South Africa, in Thailand, in many countries. It becomes even yeah. more difficult. It's really tough. We are trying, for example, to uh, standardize the insurance across all our assets, but we have to deal with different level of uh, knowledge and uh, it's I think we're looking this is a European solar conference so you just highlighted the risks globally which makes it worse but actually there's still even today 27 countries in Europe and um, <clears throat> the reality is that it, they all have slightly different rules but also very different operating structures so in Italy you have to worry about the GSE yeah. And the data that you hold on your systems is panel numbers and where they were bought from and how they were delivered because if you get that wrong, yeah. you lose your GSE. In the UK, accreditation once it's happened is relatively straightforward. If you're going to build the next generation of plants with feed-in tariffs in Spain, it's a different structure again and it goes on and on and on. So actually, um, there are some things that are common. So it is sensible to say I want to have a single monitoring platform globally and a single management tool globally. It makes sense to say that um, you know, what else? I'm, I'm struggling. I, you know, I, I, I don't believe that you have the same management team globally or across Europe. I don't believe that you have a lot of things that are the same across Europe. Maybe within a country you can move to standardization. But there's just one last thing I'll leave you with. Apart from the fact that Howard John's photograph looks like he's had it done professionally, um, and I want to have the points of view on how good he looks uh, after this, is that everybody's perspective is different. If you're an O and M, uh, by the way, I only do that too because I like him so much. Um, well, thank you. Yeah, you look very pretty. Um, <laughs> the reality is, everybody has a different perspective. So, an O and M player's perspective oh, sure, is I'm going to standardize my business processes. But he can. He can begin to standardize some of his business processes globally or across Europe because he does one job he does O and M. He doesn't own. 53 different EPC delivered plants. He doesn't own something that's designed in 20 different ways using 13 different inverter sets or worse than that, ABB, right? <laughs> he doesn't own any of those things. What he does is he provides a service and the service is uniform. That makes sense. But that said, we're just opening in Australia and we can't run can't the same team globally. We're in Australia Europe from right here. You know. So within the 28 countries of Europe, you know, you can do that, but we can't. You can't go to an investor and say, I'm going to have global solar and say any one of your mandated pots of money can put money into us. No, because they'll have half a dozen different mandates. They'll say there's UK solar, European solar, maybe a 
Australia somewhere, and maybe you'll be able to secure a global pot somewhere. But it's never unique. And actually, that sale position is very tough. So we have to recognize where you are in the life cycle, which you talked about, where you are in the value chain, and what you're trying to achieve. If you're a no longer growing, milking the investments asset manager, then that's one story. If you're in fast growth mode, it's a totally different story. William, by the way, that's his name, William. Yep. Thank you very much. <laughs> How do you think subsidy-free solar is going to change that standardization model? Are we going to see more standardization, or is subsidy-free solar going to be different, more different for each plant? Because you're not going to have a common counterpart uh, actually, necessarily. We, we've gone through a process of disassembling what is a solar plant and starting again from scratch. Because solar plants were first designed 15 years ago. She's waving. She's checking me out. Um, <laughs> solar plants were first designed 15 years ago. We have to start again from scratch. And as for standardization, yes. Actually, today at 50 to 60 pounds a megawatt hour over 15 years plus RPI, which means you have no power, power price growth, because power curves are real, right? People think of power curves and say, oh, inflation's high. No, they're not inflationary. Power Poirier, Bringer, et cetera, they're not inflationary. They're real numbers. Then you add inflation on top of that. Right? or potentially the other way. So hard Brexit, by the way, works this way and this way. If you're going to fix a price, then you have to reduce your, your costs. And a cost of a solar plant at £700,000 is unviable. At £500,000, at £60 a megawatt hour linked to RPI in the south coast of England is now a viable plant. But it has to be bankable. So now nobody's going to build a plant where the power curve shifts every three years. So you have to have a 15-year PPA. You're standardizing financial components. You're actually not necessarily standardizing the plant. And if you look at it from an O&M's point of view, the plant's no longer standard either. But my financial components are, my contracts might be, my PPAs might be, my OEM contracts and warranties, my insurance covers, but not necessarily the technology. What solar-related innovation has made the panel think, wow, in the last 12 months, if indeed there has been one? <laughs> Look at us all <laughs> bursting with <laughs> ideas there. You know what? The last, the last time I said wow was when uh, I heard, I've seen some big uh, issues on a solar farm. I said, wow, fortunately it's not my site. <laughs> <laughs> and in terms of, <laughs> maybe. The, the thing that's made me say wow, in that it's not an innovation, but it's the fact that on the 21st of, of April, for the first time in 120 years, the UK didn't have any coal power generation. Yeah and that we got, a few days before, we got 26% of our power, peak power, from solar. Yeah, and the 25th that of March, made me we say had today, well. on the 25th of March, there was more, gener more consumption on the grid after, to, after midnight than there was during the day. Yeah, yeah. So what we're seeing, the wow bit, um, no, wow was being offered a, a battery, battery and solar plant for uh, a premium price. It was like, wow, are you kidding? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to swear. Um, the reality is, this is a fifth, this is a old technology, and this is stable technology. Generally, in and we're talking Europe, stable countries, stable markets. The last time I went wow was when Spain made a retrospective change to feeding tax. Yeah. Wow, are you kidding me? <laughs> right? And generally, that's the case, right? Usually, the wow is oh, thank God it's not me. Yeah. <laughs> so there's been no upside surprises. So the, who's the most successful player? The one who minimizes the downside surprises, correct? There's no wow in that. There's no wow. The wow, it, the, it can only be wow if you're so retentive, and I didn't use that word, I'm so good, so retentive that you get excited by the minutiae of detail and the money you don't lose, <laughs> right? In the hours you don't waste, in the plant that isn't restored, in the things that you don't do, is where the wow lives. There's an old saying, and actually, uh, when my daughter went to read her PPE, uh, I have a PPE as well, and I learned a lesson out of mine, which was three things, but one of the lessons I learned, which I shared with her before the day she went off to Exeter, was we live in the universe of the small, not the universe of the big. Politicians like big, waving gestures, but actually we live in the universe of the small, an hour made over here, a pound saved over there, Right? A module rescued over here, two panels not changed this year. 
We live in the universe of the small. We like to think of big numbers. I like to think of being worth over half a billion pounds in a lot of stock exchange. Who be do, right? But actually, to get there, there were lots of really small steps. And and we live in the universe of the small. So, solar is the perfect example of the universe of the small. A five megawatt plant has twenty two thousand five hundred solar panels, right? It has one hundred and twenty four panels in a string. That string performs only as well as the worst performing panel in that string. Right? That, that inverter performs as well as that worst performing panel in all of those strings. Right? We live in the universe of the small. 2.4 millimeter wiring as opposed to 4 millimeter wiring. If we get that right, then we have a wow. The wow is recognizing you didn't mess up. <laughs> so we had some of it. After these five minutes of prayer, uh, let me go back to the question. <laughs> uh, something that I believe is really, going back to solar, now I'm talking about solar, uh, something that I really see is a game changer, uh, which I, I found it really amazing, is uh, there are some Chinese companies that design uh, Linux-type inverters, which means you assemble all the equipment, and the only thing that you need is to, to have software. So you can even have you know, freeware kind of software. So I think that is a complete game changer. So if, if this really evolves, and for example, if you consider places like Africa, in which you, know, you don't need to go back to an inverter manufacturer, which normally they are a piece of shit, and you actually get components which are freely available in the market, and you have freeware in terms of the software upgrades, that is a revolution, because it means panels now cost you nothing, then if you're able to access the inverters, you know, just assemble it yourself, uh, and then access the software online, that is a revolution. Because mm -hmm. clearly solar is the future. Uh, if you look at wind, for example, or you look at biomass, or you look, but solar really is the, is the future in terms of how the technology has advanced, in terms of how cheap it is at the moment, how easy it is to implement across, you know, South America, Africa, you know. Uh, that is really a game changer. So if you're really able to take out control of the inverter manufacturers on, on the system. And you know, at, at the end of the day, the inverter is the brain of the plant. Uh, that is a game changer, because that, through that inverter, you get a lot of information. You know what's going on. I, I think that is a revolution. Uh, and clearly, if you look at the inverter manufacturers, they are you know, if, if you look at the panels, they're very cheap. Inverters are still expensive. Uh, I can see that is, the, is, is where you can further reduce cost and completely be totally independent. There's an old saying, conceived by genius, designed by computer, built by robots, and driven by an Italian. Right? So, or, <laughs> so, 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 so it is an English joke, so we, we voted for Brexit, so we can make those jokes. Um, <laughs> so, the truth is, right, you got, the reality is that these, the Linux is great, but look at ABB inverters. They were wonderful when they were, when they were doing their job four or five years ago, and they just stopped doing their job. So again, it's back down to the person who operates yeah. that Linux operation. It's down to the small things that they do. Yeah. No, but we actually uh, you know, did an analysis on uh, one a German of manufacturer of inverters, and 95% of the components of that inverter were ABB, which means you know, you're paying a premium for something that actually is readily uh, available in the market. Someone is assembling this in Germany. They, they put some kind of IP behind the, you know, the software, and that's it. They live, have an easy life which I, I think is really blocking uh, the sector, really. Are there any lessons at all that the solar market can learn from more traditional power plants, particularly when it comes to optimization and, and operation? We're, we're a different sector. I think the biggest challenge we, we're going to face over the next three years is grid management, right? Uh, the, the, and and subsidy-free sort of growing. Growth is the problem, right? Growth is going to be a problem for us whatever happens. And some people are going to make a lot of money out of managing the grid. If they, couldn't, if they can get the cost of capital right. But what are we going to learn from other players? I think when somebody, are, I spend a lot of time on policy and I, I go speak to government ministers and, I, and MPs and all those people. Why? Because we want to know what they're going to do in two years' time, right? Just a heads up. Maybe help them to make, not make a mistake. And interestingly, I mean, they, they think of us the same way as, as, as other plants. And they seem to think that the market will be disrupted in the near future. The market is disrupted, yeah, yes. right? There is total disruption in the marketplace. The, the stats that Tom talked about earlier on, right, Mr. Tom, 
Because it's on now. Yeah, Mr. Tom. Um, and um, the 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 the. Um, no, we could, I've been calling you Tom for three years. It's just I already realised what your name was this week. Um, you can but, call me Tom if you like. Yes, right. Thanks, mate. So uh, what I'm trying to say is that the market is totally, utterly disrupted. Uh, and so therefore, all of the rules, all of the rules have to be rewritten. There isn't a single rule that makes sense anymore. So they talk about AI managing the grid. Why? Because they'll take a fleet of people. So I love the new one, which is you're going to park your Tesla and it's going to discharge and, and we're going to have a market for recharge and discharge at the micro level. Has anybody seen the contemplate the size of the database required to do that? Right. Alternatively, we have a free for all market, and then somebody's going to say, "I can't manage the grid." Right. So somebody somewhere is going to have to manage discharge and recharge, just so the grid stays stable. The size of that database is overwhelming. It's 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 the NSA type database size. So people talk about this stuff, you know, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, it's, it's fantastic, we're going to plug our Teslas in, everybody's going to be able to afford an 80,000 pound Tesla, it's going to be fantastic, Brexit, it's going to be, we're going to be rich. Actually, none of that stuff is true. And we are, we're, we're, not, we're not looking at a market that anybody can understand today, because nowhere in the world has the market the UK has. And nowhere in the world have we seen a market progress as quickly as the UK has. And nowhere in the world have we got a market where the fleet is so aged that the conversation should not be about supplementing generation with renewables. It should be substitution of generation, which currently requires substitution. Your coal fleets, your gas fleets, you know, your capacity mechanism is only building one new plant. You know, fundamentally, we're looking at a market that is totally disrupted, and there is very little traditional plants are going to tell us because we don't have feedstock. We don't have OPEX volatility, we don't have discharge volatility. I think we're writing the new game. Go on, contradict me. No, I agree with you. I think one of the issues that I see on top of that in terms of disruption is that, you know, uh, the, the European Union had, had a plan for, uh, you know, accelerated interconnection. Uh, I think if the UK is out of the EU, obviously that funding will not go to the UK. So, you know, this uh, island uh, will become more an energy island, which, to be honest with you, if you have all these great programs and all this new capacity that is not being built, uh, that program will be, uh, you know, incremental. I was just going to add something. Perhaps it's not what we need to learn from the existing system, but it's what we need to we need to fundamentally recognise our difference. So, let's face it, the existing system is owned by four large companies and they have big centralised power stations. Okay, the neighbours to those power stations maybe don't like or do like the look of them, depending if they work there or not. We're not like that. We're distributed. We're all over the country. We're all over Europe. We'll be all over the world. And I think it's about actually how we be good neighbours um, and bring people with us. Because the last thing we need is, is to, to alienate the population and make them think like this is a a bunch of city investors getting very rich out of out of uh, these assets rather than something that they're involved with as well. And I think there we have to be careful and it is a fundamental difference from the existing power system. That seems as good a place as any to, to leave it. <laughs>